one. Let's find this remote here. Has God been good to you? I'm, good, I'm glad to see you all out this evening. And I pray that as we get into the word of God this evening, the Lord will bless us because we do need the Lord at such a time as this. Amen. Amen. And we have a lot of information to get into this evening, so I'm not going to worry you with my words. I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. And as it is my tradition, as we go into prayer, I want us to do two things. Number one, please pray for yourself. Ask the Spirit of God to speak to you as an individual. Brothers and sisters, if you want to have an intimate experience with the Lord, you need the Spirit of God. So pray for the Spirit of God to speak to you personally. And please pray for myself because I know my need of the Lord at this time as well. So as it is my tradition, I'm going to kneel and pray. And I invite you to kneel with me as we go before the throne of God. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Please pray in your hearts to yourself. Pray to the Lord. And then I'll close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again this evening it is our great privilege to come together before your throne in prayer. And we're thankful for your mercies being extended to us, how you've kept us safe in all of our different activities throughout this day. And now as we come together, we ask that your Holy Spirit will not just fill this place but that your Holy Spirit will move upon each one of our hearts. My Lord, open thou our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Sanctify us through thy truth, Father, for thy word is truth. Establish us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lift us up as a people that you can use to vindicate your character in this great controversy. There are many here this evening that are being mastered by the enemy. And I pray for them in the name of Jesus this evening that you would set their minds free. That you would help them to realize, O Lord, that in the hours we are now living, we must turn our backs on this world and grab hold of Jesus Christ with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our strength, with everything that is within us. We need to give our hearts over to your service because the time is at hand for Jesus Christ to return. My Lord, as I love to claim your promise to me in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, I claim it again this evening where you said, Call upon me and I will answer thee and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, I pray that you would open up our understanding that we might be able to comprehend, discern, be able to clearly see what is going on right now in our world and how close we are to the closing of the doors of probation. And may we be wise and make our calling and election sure this evening before we leave this place May we choose Jesus to be the king of our lives. Father, I ask that you would cleanse me and that you would remove everything that is deplorable, that is disgusting and unrighteous in me, O Lord. Cleanse me of pride and selfishness. Remove everything from me, Lord, that will make your spirit not be able to use me the way that you desire to use me this evening. Because we need to hear your voice clearly. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. And now with all the angelic host I say. Lift up your heads O ye gates. And be lifted up ye everlasting doors. 
and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. You and you alone are the king of glory, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles. Matter of fact, even before you open your Bibles, I want you to turn your eyes to the wall. What you're looking at right now is some technology that's been developed by the military industrial complex. As you can see, it's called Big Dog. This weaponry has been designed to assist the U.S. military in seeking out enemy combatants, violent extremists, or what we simply know as terrorists. This contraption can climb mountains, can walk in snow, it's got the balance of a ballerina. It carries a 200 pound payload and it's fully equipped with a fully automatic 45 caliber rifle. You ever seen a 45 caliber bullet before? It'll blow a hole right through you. Once again, this technology has been developed to assist the military in seeking out enemy combatants, violent extremists, or what we simply call what? terrorists. Here's some more interesting technology that's been developed by the military industrial complex. It looks like a pigeon, but it's really a covert surveillance device. It's called an MAV. And this technology has been developed to assist our military once again in carrying out covert surveillance operations and seeking out enemy um, violent combatants, or rather enemy extremists or violent extremists, enemy combatants or terrorists. Oh, here we go. Can you see now? Enemy combatants, violent extremists or terrorists. And as you'll see, they have not only developed this technology to look like and to simulate the flight patterns of a bird, but they've actually developed this technology to look like and simulate the flight patterns of the average house fly. And these covert surveillance devices, these insect drones, they're also equipped with explosives so that they can attach themselves to their targets, be self-destructed, thereby destroying their target. Once again, this technology has been developed to assist the military the authorities in seeking out violent extremists, enemy combatants, or terrorists. Are you following me so far? Now, you may be wondering why am I showing you all this technology dealing with terrorists. You're going to find out in a moment. But what you're looking at right now is an actual test flight of one of these nano hummingbirds or hummingbird drones. So that's the hummingbird drone. And that's the video feed that's coming back from the Hummingbird drone. Can you see it now? Not only that, here's the insect drones that they've developed. Now, if you saw that, would you know that was a robotic device? These things have been sighted in large metropolitan areas in the United States of America. Would you believe that something like that could possibly be lethal? Once again, these devices have been developed. This is not something that is in development stages. These are things that are actually currently in, in existence and being used to seek out enemy combatants, violent extremists, or terrorists. Now, I said earlier, you may be wondering why I'm talking about all of this technology that's been developed to seek out terrorists. Well, here's the reason. 
Beginning in April 7th of 2009, DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security, ever heard of the Department of Homeland Security before? The Department of Homeland Security began to release these reports on right-wing extremism the current economic and political climate fueling resurgence in radicalization and recruitment. In short, in simple terms, these briefings were developed to give people an understanding of the growth of homegrown terrorism in the United States of America. And in these documents, the Department of Homeland Security began to list different types of philosophies or teachings that people can promote that would make them possible threats to the United States government, possible violent extremists, radicals, enemy combatants. Amongst this list of teachings or philosophies, what do you think was in there? <laughs> have mercy, they didn't go that far yet. But brother, they might as well have. They might as well have, as you're going to know in a second. Well, amongst what was listed, amongst uh, the different teachings that one could promote that can make you a violent extremist or a terrorist, are those that teach end-time prophecies. So if you teach end-time prophecies, you can be a possible threat to the United States government. And then in further reports that were released by this same Department of Homeland Security, they also said those that are anti-Catholic could possibly be violent extremists, enemy combatants, or homegrown terrorists in the United States of America. Whoa! Do you know anybody that teaches end-time prophecies? Brothers and... Have mercy. Brothers and sisters... The books of Daniel and Revelation are prophetic books. They contain end-time prophecies. And these books have been encouraged by Jesus to be studied by all of his disciples throughout all the ages. So if one desires to be a follower, a true follower of Jesus Christ, and to study those things which he has left for our edification, our instruction, and our guidance in these last days, and to teach these things to the world, brothers and sisters, according to the Department of Homeland Security, you're in big trouble. And to up the ante. Just recently, CNN produced an article. You've heard of CNN before, haven't you? CNN produced an article, and this article was entitled, When Religion Turns Evil. When Religion Turns Evil. And they released this article in lieu of what just happened with the Boston Massacre. Oh, you didn't think they were going to use that for anything, did you? And they numbered four things, four things that let you know if somebody's religion is turning evil. Do you want to hear the list? Number one, if a person claims that they have the truth and you don't. If you claim you have the truth, your religion might be turning evil. Well, have mercy. Jesus says, I am the truth. But, but, but let's go a little bit further. Number two, if you teach that the end of the world is coming, your religion is turning evil, according to CNN. Well, the Bible says the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. That's what the Bible says in 2 Peter 4 and verse 7. So in other words, brothers and sisters, if you teach the Bible and believe everything that's in the Bible without compromising, your religion might be turning evil. in the minds of these men. What I'm trying to share with you this evening is right now there is a movement afoot by the political powers to marginalize religion. Let me make it clear. 
There is a movement afoot to make being a true Christian, a true believer in the word of God, one that keeps the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to make you as a radical extremist. And they will deal with you like a radical extremist. Question is, how close are we to these things? Let's take a look. Before we even go one step further, this is an actual PowerPoint slide from an Army Reserve training session dealing with religious extremism. At the top of the list, they have evangelical Christianity. I'm trying to let you know that they're educating people that have guns in their hands and that are supposed to enforce the law that if you abide by all that is contained within the 66 books of the Bible without swerving, you're a problem maker. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see how close we are to a time in which God's people will be dealt with for standing for the truth. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel 2. That's where we're going to start this evening. Daniel, the second chapter. Because in Daniel, the ch second chapter, we find one of the most comprehensive Bible prophecies. And for those of you here that are not familiar with Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to give you a little bit of backdrop before we get into the prophetic information found within Daniel chapter 2 and then deal with the interpretation of the prophetic information that's found within Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we're told of a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the worldwide governing superpower at that time known as Babylon. One night we are told that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Matter of fact, he dreamed dreams. He had the same dream over and over and over again, and he knew there was something important about that dream. But in the midst of having the dream, his sleep broke from him, the word of God said. And as he arose from this dream knowing there was something important about this dream, but not being able to remember what he dreamt, Nebuchadnezzar called for all of his trusted counselors, the soothsayers, the magicians, the Chaldeans, the sorcerers, all of these men that he looked to to give him wise instruction. And he required of them to do two things. Number one, to reveal to him the dream that he had, and number two, to give an interpretation of the dream that he had. But these individuals were not capable of revealing to Nebuchadnezzar the dream, neither its interpretation. Why? Because the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was a dream that was given to him by God. And these men were not servants of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says in speaking with the prophetic information that God reveals unto humanity in the book of Deuteronomy 29 and 29. Keep your finger in Daniel 2. Go with me to Deuteronomy 29 29. Are you there? Deuteronomy 29, 29. I'm just going to keep moving. If I go too fast, you'll tell me, slow, brother, all right? Slow, brother. Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belongeth unto the Lord thy God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we might do all the words of his what? So only those whose hearts are ready to yield to be obedient to the revealed will of God only these type of individuals that are willing to submit to God, these are the people that God will reveal his secret things unto. But these men that were Nebuchadnezzar's counselors, they were not servants of God. They would never follow God. These men were in the occult. These men were demon worshipers. These men were sorcerers. They were all caught up in the black arts, and therefore God would have nothing to do with them. But because they were not able to fulfill the request of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar became upset, he was irate, he was mad, and he sent forth a death decree to slay all the wise men in Babylon. And so Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, went forth carrying out the decree of Nebuchadnezzar, and he did so hastily. But we are told that in Babylon at that time, there were four Hebrew young men that were educated in the schools of Babylon, to become wise men in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to call them by their real names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you want to know their Babylonian names, it's Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know those names, don't you, right? Amen. 
And when Ariok came unto them, getting ready to carry out the king's decree, which is to take off their heads, Daniel said, why has this decree gone forth so hastily from the king? Then Ariok told Daniel what had taken place a little bit earlier that day. And then Daniel required, asked if he, if he could receive some time. And if he could receive some time, that he would be able to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar the dream and its interpretation. And so when his request was granted by Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel and his three friends went and prayed. They got on their knees and they sought God. And God, always being faithful to his promises, he revealed to them both the dream and its interpretation. Are you following me so far? Okay, now let's jump into the dream. It's found within Daniel 2 and verse 31. And if you're familiar with this already, good. I'm sure we're going to look at some information tonight that you may have not taken a look at, already, at before already. Amen? But the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 31, when you have it, just say amen. The Bible says, But thou, thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was what? Terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his feet. Now, come on now. His feet, of, his legs of iron, his feet part of Part of iron, rather, and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet. Am I right? That were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became as the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, that there was no place found for them anymore. And then the stone which smote the image became a great mountain, and fill the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof before the king. Okay, so we saw what was the dream all about, right? You saw what was in the dream, did you not? We saw an image. Head of gold, breast and arms of what? Come on, guys, you got to help me out here. Breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part of iron and part of clay. Then a stone comes and smites the image, and the whole image is broken down, and then that stone becomes a great mountain. Fills the whole earth. Amen. Now, now, let's go back for a second because I'm helping you out right now. Now, go with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2 beginning at verse 37 because now we're going to look at the interpretation of what that image was all about. Are you there with me? The Bible says there, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and Power and strength and glory, for wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom that is inferior to thee, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over some of the earth. Over all the earth. I'm trying to make sure you're reading the Bible with me. Amen? So... The Bible just let us know what these metals were symbolic of. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38, we're told that the head of gold was a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar's empire, that was Babylon. Then we're told that the breast and arms of silver is symbolic of a kingdom that would rise up into existence after Babylon, that would be inferior to Babylon, the same way that silver is inferior to gold, and a third kingdom of Brass doesn't get any more clear than that. So each one of these metals are symbolic of kingdoms, political powers, stately powers. Are you following me so far? The head of gold is our beginning point. We know that to be Babylon. So what kingdom came into existence and began to rule over the then known world after Babylon? Your answer is? Media Persia. Somebody give me a scripture to prove that. Oh, I see. I knew you were going to be loud on Media Persia. But where's the scripture, brother? How do you know it's true? Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if you don't speak according to that word, there's no light in you. Come on, is there no light in anybody in here? No light in anybody in here. Daniel chapter 8? No. You want to prove without a shadow of a doubt that after Babylon came up Medo Persia. Don't scratch your head now. Okay, go with me to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. See, the whole purpose for us coming together is not just so that I can be preaching some things to you, but you need to learn the truth for yourself so that you can go and teach it to someone else. That's the whole importance of the matter, brothers and sisters. We have to know the truth. 
The Bible says in Daniel chapter 5, and before we get into the information we were looking for, in Daniel 5, we're told that Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, began to rule over Babylon. And one night, Belshazzar, one day, Belshazzar had a drunken party. And in the midst of all of their revelry and debauchery, he said to uh, his servants, you know what, go into the treasure house and get those vessels that we took out of the temple when we uh, conquered the Jewish nation. What we're going to do with those vessels is we're going to pour uh, wine in those vessels. And we're going to worship the gods of gold and of silver and of iron and of nothing. And in the midst of all of their foolishness, God sent forth a bloodless hand that began to write on the wall. Belshazzar was so terrified, the Bible says that his loins were loosed. They could not understand the writing on the wall. Counselors, once again, could not understand. Who did they call? Daniel. Daniel comes in. Go with me to Daniel 5, verse 25 now. The Bible tells us this is what Daniel said in Daniel 5, and verse 25. This is the writing that was written. Many, many, take all you farson. This is the interpretation of that thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Take all, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Can't get any clearer than that, can it? Babylon fell, it was given to the Medes and the Persians. So your breast and arms of silver are symbolic of the kingdom of Media, Persia. So now we're down to the belly and thighs of brass. What kingdom came into existence and began to rule over the then known world after Media, Persia? You say Greece. We're going to go to the scripture my brother said earlier. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8. Now in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel the prophet had a vision. And in this vision, Daniel saw a ram. This ram had two horns. One was higher than the other. The ram was pushing in different directions. All of a sudden, it seemed as though nothing could conquer this ram, but all of a sudden, we see this rough he-goat. And this rough he-goat had one notable horn between its eyes, and it moved with such speed, such rapidity upon the face of the earth that the Bible tells us that its feet did not even touch the ground. And it moved with great cholor, which means warlike anger towards that ram. And it came upon the ram, knocked it down, began to, began to stamp on the ram, but in the process, that one horn broke. But it began to rule in the place where the ram was previously ruling. Are you following so far? Now we're going to find out what these beasts are symbolic of. Look at Daniel 8 and verse 20. Are you there? The Bible says here, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and so the ram was symbolic of Media and Persia. Look at verse 21 now. And the rough he-goat is what? The king of Grecia. We can just stop right there. Matter of fact, go further. What does it continue to say? And the great horn, which thou what? Which was between his eyes, was the first king. So brothers and sisters, in the war between the ram and the goat, who won, the goat or the ram or the ram or the goat? I didn't, don't let me confuse you now. The goat ran. The goat won. The goat took out the ram. What kingdom was the goat symbolic of? Greece. It had one notable horn between its eyes that broke when it became strong. That was symbolic of Alexander the Great. When, Medi when, when Greece came into its power, Alexander the Great also died, and he dry, be, died because of intemperance. He was a drunkard. But we're told when that one horn broke off, four horns came up in its place, but not in its power. And that was symbolic of the four generals that were able to divide between themselves the kingdom of Grecia. And their names were Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. So the Bible is very clear and definite with all of this information. Before it even became history, it was revealed in prophecy. And so now it brings us down to the legs of iron. So I'm going to assume that some of you here know a little bit of history. What was the kingdom that began to rule over the then known world after Greece? Rome. But in particular, say it again. Pagan Rome. Rome during its pagan phase. All throughout the Bible, we see that Rome passes through two phases. You can see this in history books as well. You have pagan Rome, then you have the Holy Roman Empire or Papal Rome as we know it as well. Are you following me so far? 
And so it was pagan Rome that's symbolized by those legs of iron. It was pagan Rome that was responsible for crucifying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross at the request of the Jewish nation. But now it brings us down to the point of scripture which we're going to spend more time on this evening. Verse 41 of Daniel chapter 2. Go with me there. Pay close attention to every word that you see within this verse of scripture. Are you there? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of what type of clay? Potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But in it shall be of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now, brothers and sisters, prior to this, all we've been looking at is metals. Are, am, I, am I right? And we found out that all of these metals are highly symbolic. They're all symbolic of political power, stately powers, or kingdoms. Now we have a new material that's introduced into the makeup of this statue. That material is potter's clay. Am I right? That's what verse 41 says. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. Am I correct? So, if all of these metals are highly symbolic... Would it not also be fair to say that that potter's clay must be symbolic of something as well? What is potter's clay a symbol of in the word of God? Go with me to Jeremiah 18 and verse 6. Jeremiah 18 and verse 6. What is potter's clay a symbol of in the word of God? Don't miss all this information. Because as you study out the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, you see that God makes all things clear to our understanding and he's laying things out that have been and what will take place in the future for us right now. Are you following me so far? Bible says in Jeremiah 18 and verse 6, when you have it, you say amen. I, still, I see people turning scripture still. Bible says, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this Potter saith the Lord God, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Notice that God likened the house of Israel unto the clay that a potter would have in his hand. What type of clay do you think a potter has in his hand? How about potter's clay? Potter's clay. Matter of fact, go with me to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. In Jeremiah 18 and verse 6, God likened the house of Israel unto potter's clay. Brothers and sisters, the house of Israel is nothing more than the children of Israel. The children of Israel were the people of God. Am I right here so far? Amen. I know it's true. I just want to make sure you know it's true. Amen. Look what the Bible says, Isaiah 64. Now here the people of God are talking. The children of Israel are talking here. They say, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. And thou our potter. And we are the works of thine hands. So the house of Israel acknowledges and says, Lord, you're the potter. We're the clay. Mold us and make us according to your will. So God in the scriptures, likens the children of Israel, his people, unto potter's clay. Are you following so far? Now, the Bible also has another name for the children of Israel. You want to know what it is? Go with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. Don't lose any of these principles. It's important. Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. When you have it, say amen. Look what the Bible says here. The word of God tells us, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. We can just stop right there because we got to the point. What did God call the children of Israel? His church. Are you following me, brothers and sisters? So God likened the house of Israel or the children of Israel unto potter's clay. And the children of Israel are God's church. Is potter's clay not a fitting symbol for God's church? A people that God can mold 
and fashioned in his image and in his likeness. Matter of fact, potter's clay by definition is a clay that is free from any dirt or sediment, any foreign material. Any time you introduce any other material into potter's clay, it's no longer fit for the potter's use. He's got to throw it away. Got to start over again. Have mercy. Because the Bible tells us that the iron mixed with the potter's clay. Now, everything that we've looked at thus far, we can prove from history, can't we? We can prove that Babylon came and fell, can't we? We can prove that Media Persia came after Babylon and it fell. Just we can look that up in Wikipedia if we want to. We can prove that Greece came after Media Persia and it fell. And we can then prove that pagan Rome then came into existence and then fell as well, can we not? We can prove this in any history book. However, brothers and sisters... We are now down to these feet that were of iron and clay. By the way, what was the iron a symbol of? The pagan Roman Empire. Are you following me? If the legs were made of iron, which symbolized the pagan Roman Empire, and the potter's clay is a symbol of God's people or his church, historically, was there a time that the pagan Roman Empire entered into a league with the church? It's called the development of the papacy. Papal Rome. Is it a fact? In the year 321 AD, a man by the name of Constantine the Great passed an edict, a law, requesting, not requesting, requiring that everyone that lived in the Roman Empire at that time had to rest on what they called the Venerable Day of the Sun. We call it today Sunday. It was the first national Sunday law. Don't miss it. Everybody had to rest on that day, except for those that lived in the countries, lest they lost an opportunity to reap the crops. That fusion between the church and the state marked the time of the birth of this union that we're looking at here. Notice what the Bible says. Look at Daniel 2 and verse 41. Look how the information there is so precise in Daniel 2 and verse 41. Are you there? It says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But in it shall be of the strength of the iron. What was the iron symbolic of? In other words, here's two points you don't want to miss. Point number one. When the church would unite with the state, the church would use the power of the state to enforce its dogmas on the people. The strength would be of the iron. Point number two, when the church united with the pagans, the pagans didn't convert, the, rather the Christians didn't convert the pagans, the pagans converted the Christians. I'll never forget it. First time that I visited the Vatican. I went to, I went to Rome. I visited the Vatican. I was, I was a young man. I'm still a young man. Two things that I never forgot. Here's the first thing I never forgot. No woman could enter into St. Peter's Basilica if she didn't have a skirt on. Let me say that one more time. No woman could enter into St. Peter's Basilica unless she had a skirt on. Satan demands his reverence. It's a fact. Point number two. They have this statue in there of Peter. It's really a statue of Jupiter. They just call him Peter. It's made of cast iron. The people kissed and rubbed the feet of that statue so many times that there's no foot there anymore. It's just a mass of metal. 
brothers and sisters, every form of paganism, you can find it in the Vatican. The biggest obelisk, it's in Vatican Square. The biggest solar wheel, it's in Vatican Square. Matter of fact, they had something called the Pantheon that the Romans set up. The Pantheon was this temple that they set up that every time the Roman armies conquered a nation, they would take their pagan gods or idols and they would place them inside of that building. So it was just bas it was basically basically like a like a museum of pagan idols. Well, it's no longer that. They just converted it now into a cathedral for Mary. You get my point? The strength would be of the iron. Paganism would convert Christianity in this fusion between the church and the state. And that's what happens for any of us, brothers and sisters. Any time you try to enter into league with the world, you will always become like the world. And so many times we're deceived in thinking, you know what? We can bring them to Jesus if we do what they're doing. No, maybe if we make up holy hip-hop. We need some holy reggae. Ain't no such thing! There is no way you're going to bring the world to Jesus by being like the world. There has to be a marked difference. Brothers and sisters, if people want the world, they just stay in the world. Go back with me to Daniel 2 and verse 41. Daniel 2 and verse 41. Look what it says there. I want you to get all the information. It says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but in it shall be of the strength of the iron, for as much, don't miss this, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. But I thought it was potter's clay. Did you see what happened to the clay? It changed. When the potter's clay mingled with the iron, or rather, when the church mingled with the state and was contaminated by paganism, the church became miry. You know what the word miry means, right? It means dirty. It means filthy. It's contaminated. Matter of fact, I want you to see what the word, what miry clay is a symbol of in the Bible. Go with me to Psalms 40, Psalms 40 and verse 2. In the book of Psalms, chapter 40, beginning at verse 1, David, Psalms 40, beginning at verse 1, David speaks of his experience of how God drew him out of a life of sin and iniquity and established him in Jesus Christ. And if we look at Psalms 40 and verse 2, the Bible says, Psalms 40 verse 2, it says, He brought me up also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now that rock is Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. So the lifestyle of the horrible pit and the miry clay was one he had to be redeemed from so he could be in Christ. What does Christ redeem us from? Sin. So the miry clay is a symbol of sin. What is the only definition of sin found within the Bible? It's in 1 John 3 and 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The miry clay is a symbol of transgressing the law of God. Therefore, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, when we see that the potter's clay became miry clay, it lets us know that the church was guilty of transgressing God's law. Did the papacy transgress the law of God? Come on now, Daniel chapter 7. We are told that this power, the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7, which is the symbol that's used there for the papal Roman Empire, we are told that it would think to change times and laws. The papacy removed the second commandment, which is forbidding uh, the worshipping of images. That's why you can see all of these different statues and images within their worship system. And they completely changed the fourth commandment, which tells us to remember 
the Sabbath day, God's seventh day to keep it holy and not the first day, which they have appointed now as God's rest day. But they cannot appoint anything to be God's rest day because only God can make something holy and sanctify it. The Pope has no ability to sanctify a sandwich. Amen. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, this power is discussed to the very T. Right here in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. And then in verses 42 and 43 of Daniel chapter 2, we're told of a time in which the nations of our world would, sink, would seek to bring about all the world or other nations under one government structure and they would seek to do so through intermarriage and military conquest. Napoleon tried to do it, Hitler tried to do it, Charlemagne tried to do it, etc., etc. They were all unsuccessful. But then the Bible goes on to say in Daniel 2 and verse 44. But in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms and shall stand forever. And all of that right there in verse 44 is a symbol or rather the interpretation of of the symbol of the stone smiting the image in its feet. Brothers and sisters, that stone is symbolic of Jesus Christ coming and overthrowing the kingdoms of this world and establishing God's eternal order. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, go with me to the book. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 21. Let's just look at it. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. Matthew 21 verse 42. Please, when you have it, say amen. Matthew 21 and verse 42. Don't get tired. We just got started. Matthew 21 and verse 42. Are you there? The Bible tells us in Matthew 21 and verse 42. Jesus said, did you never read? The stone which the builders rejected. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is what? Marvelous in our eyes. Now jump down to verse 44. The Bible goes on to say what? Whosoever therefore shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him into powder. Did you know that that word powder in the original Greek means that the stone will grind him into chaff? Did you see that word chaff anywhere else? It's in Daniel chapter 2, when the stone smites the image, it's crumbled and it becomes like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. Jesus Christ was even then speaking of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. And he said, now's the time to fall on the stone. Now's the time to have those sinful traits of your character broken up. Now's the time to have a transformation experience. Now's the time to yield your house, hearts to Jesus Christ. Because when he comes, he's coming for business. Fall on the stone. Don't let the stone fall on you. And the Bible lets us know at what time the stone will come. We are told but in the days of these kings. Did you see that in Daniel 2 and verse 44? Did you see that? The phrase in the days of. You can't miss this. The phrase in the days of means during the lifetime of. During the existence of these kings. That's when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Well, what kings is the Bible talking about? Come on now, think about it. I'm giving you some time. I'm flipping some slides right here. Think about it. Somebody said something. Say, say it again. The brother said the kings are in the toes. Well, it can't be talking about Nebuchadnezzar, could it? Because he's dead and gone. Can't be talking about Darius or Cyrus. Can't be talking about Alexander the Great or Ptolemy, Seleucus or any of those, could he be? He's not talking about the Caesars. Whoever those kings are, they have to be associated with those feet. Those feet that were emerging of iron and clay. Are you following me? And whoever those kings are, brothers and sisters, not only are they associated with the feet because the stone hits the feet, but those kings have to be kings that will be reigning in the future because Jesus has not come as of yet. Are you following me? 
So does the Bible speak of ten kings? By the way, I, I said ten kings because if you have, if God has blessed you, how many toes do you have on your feet? Ten. Does the Bible speak of ten kings that will be in existence just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ that will enter into controversy with Christ? That will collide with the stone? Go with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation, the 17th chapter. Word of God is sweet, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 17. Let's begin at verse 12. When you have it, say amen. Bible says, Revelation chapter 12, rather, Revelation 17, rather. Sorry about that. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12. Look what the word of God says, beginning at verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten what? Which have no kingdom as of yet, but shall receive power as what? Kings for how long? One hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. But now look at the very next verse. And these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is king of, rather he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those that are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. Brothers and sisters, who's that lamb that those ten kings are going to make war with? That's Jesus. That's what the Bible says in John 129, that Jesus is the lamb. But, but Jesus said that he was the stone, didn't he? Are you getting my point right now? The ten kings make war with the stone at the end. They make war with the lamb. They make war with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, those are the ten kings that we're looking at in Daniel chapter 2. And we're told that right before Jesus comes, there will be ten kings that will make war with the Lamb. And these ten kings, all of them will have one mind. What does it mean that they'll have one mind? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about it. How about that? Go with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 2. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible lets us know in principle, in principle, what it means to have one mind. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2, and as you turn there, I'm going to look at another scripture, amen? Are you there? You let me know by saying amen, and I'll keep going. Okay, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be what? Like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So in principle, to be of one mind, you must be in one accord. So this means that in the future, the ten kingdoms, or the ten kings, by the way, the number ten in the Bible is a, num a universal number. Did you hear that? That means that in the future, the nations of our world, all of them, they will all be united or there will be a uniting of the nations or a united nations. Are you with me? But for them to be united as well, they must all have the same love type of love you think they might have? Go with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. What does the Bible say about love? Are you there? Come on, we all know this one. You know, this, is, this is one of the few scriptures that everybody knows. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Brothers and sisters, do you think it may be possible that in the very near future, the nations of our world will be inclined that they'll be enticed to unite together as one for the purpose of stabilizing their economies to secure their prosperity and their wealth. We just saw it in the Bible yesterday. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3, the word of God said they're going to be saying peace and safety. Security and prosperity. Are you hearing this? Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that in the very near future, we are going to see a one world government system. And that one world government system will fuse together the iron and the clay. 
because that's what the feet are made out of. Let's make it plain. This one, world, this one world government system will unite church and state in a one world global order. And as the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 15, which tells us there, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past, which simply means the things that happened in the past, they're taking place right now in our present day society. And the things that are going to happen in the future, they've already taken place in the past. And God requires of us to have a knowledge of those historic events so we can better understand what's going on right now and what's getting ready to happen. Brothers and sisters, we know that in the past, when the clay mingled with the iron, the papacy was involved. You're not hearing me. When the clay mingled with the, with the iron, there was a setting up of a national Sunday law. With the, when the clay mingled with the iron... Everybody that refused to obey the dictates of the Pope were persecuted, slain, and sent to bloody graves. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. So the question is, how close are we to this time in which all the nations of our world will unite together? Church and state will be united together. Sunday will become a mandatory day of rest. And the papacy will once again ascend to the seat of global dominance. How far are we from that? I'm not going to leave you hanging. You give me a little volume on this. I have a few things I'd like to share with you. I want you to listen to this before we even go any further. You see this right here? This is the United Nations Millennium Development Goals Report from 2009. In this Millennium Development Goals Report, they've divided the world into 10 regions. Go figure! Here's the more interesting part. Why did they divide the world into ten regions? For the purpose of evenly distributing the wealth between the nations. It's for economics! But we just read that in the Bible. Why? Because this is the more sure word of prophecy. Let's go a little bit further with this. This is, uh, I'm going to give, take you down through history a little bit, okay? This is from 2008, BBC News. Oh, matter of fact, let's start with this one. Yeah, that's good. Pope urges forming new world what? To work for the common good. Does anybody here remember this? The Pope called for a new world economic order. As you're going to see further, he's calling for a one world government system. Watch this. On Tuesday, he called for a radical rethinking of the global economy criticizing a growing divide between rich and poor and urging the establishment of a true world political authority. Who's calling for this? The Pope. That which hath been is, that which is to be hath already to oversee the economy and work for the common good. It proposes a true world political authority that would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. It sounds so good. It would be asked to manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, and to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis. Going forward... Then, in a passage that builds on ideas first voiced by his predecessor, John Paul II, the Pope argues that globalization has made necessary, don't miss this, the reform of the United Nations organization, and likewise of economic institutions and international finance, so that the concept of the family of nations can acquire real teeth. You can only guess who they want to bite. 
Notice that when he's calling for this true one world political authority, he's saying we need a reform of the United Nations organization. This is because they want the United Nations to be the seat of the one world order. But its responsibilities would be more than just economic. They would include securing timely disarmament, food security, and peace. Peace and safety. The new body, he's just going to say it straight out right here, the new body, a reformed UN, would also be called upon to guarantee the protection of the environment and to regulate migration. Interesting. 2008, Pope says, we need a one world government. It needs to be a reformed UN. 2009, the United Nations says, we need to divide the world into 10 regions to disperse the wealth. This is prophecy fulfilling right before your face. Okay. Same, um, uh, same, same situation. Different, different, uh, different um, news outfit. This is from USA Today. The title of this article is Pope Calls for God-Centered Global Economy. Pope Benedict XVI today called for reforming the United Nations and establishing a true world political authority with real teeth to manage the global economy with God-centered ethics. He's talking about a global political order that is governed by religious principles. What's that, brothers and sisters? Church and state. That which hath been is now. That which is to be hath already been. Watch this statement here. The encyclical also echoes Benedict's many speeches saying that to reach sound the global economy, every responsibility and commitment must, must be rooted in the values of Christian truth. Who's Christian truth? Their brand of Christian truth. Remember, their brand of Christian truth is the Pope is infallible, he is the vicar, the representative of God on earth. And whatever he says is law. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. 2010. Listen closely. This is BBC News. Mondays used to be a very different day to uh, the rest of the week. One day we could all relax, we could see friends and family, we could go to church. It's all changed. Should the Sabbath be a day of rest? We, I mean, Christina, we've, we've gone beyond the point of, uh, of return on this, haven't we? I mean, you know, here you are, you've got a deadline for tomorrow, you've got to write an article, you've got to appear on a wonderful television program on a Sunday morning. It's just, it's not the way we live now, is it? No, but wouldn't it be nice if the government sent us a message that they didn't think of us only as units of consumption and, and production and yeah. worker bees. Yeah. Just once in a week, we were let off the hook and we could not shop and we could not work and, uh, and actually concentrate on, on the other, on the whole self. On each other. And on each other. Why not? Oh, it sounds so good. Sundays used to be a very different day in the week. But then he calls Sunday the Sabbath. Are you following? But did you notice how they discussed the whole Sabbath issue? They said it should be a day in which we don't have to shop. We can spend time with each other. Where was God in it? Do you know why they're presenting the concept of a day of rest without God? They're presenting it this way, brothers and sisters, so that the people that are not religiously inclined will also like the idea of there being a day of rest. So they're secularizing the concept of Sabbath for the pagan. That's nothing new. They did that in the times past as well. That's the, that's the same way that Constantine was able to get the pagans to start worship, the pagans and the Christians to come together on one day in times past. 
I want you to see this is what they're doing. They are trying to present a day of rest to the public as something that is not just for Christians, it's for everybody. Watch this. <laughs> CNN. So Judith, you know, it's kind of the perfect weekend to talk about an Easter weekend and, um, you know, we just had Passover, right? So let's talk to me about, talk to me about the Sabbath, what it means, and just religion aside, what it means. Did you catch that? Just religion aside. It means to you. The Sabbath is two things to me. One, it's this incredible idea. It's really one of the great ideas in human history. It's transformed the world. It's affected the way we, we've lived for thousands of years. And I was interested in thinking about it, studying it, learning its history, before it kind of disappeared from our lives. So that's, that was the big idea that I, that I was, had about the Sabbath. And then I was, what it meant to me personally was it was a way to get outside of the work-a-day, driven, careerist life that I was leading. You know, it's interesting because you talk about, you know, Christians, any religion, um, people have these moments where they feel like they're searching for something, right? And then it can be even harder now, as you say, you know, we have all of, we're connected and show my Blackberry and my iPhone and you're always connected. Um, and sometimes, do you, do you think it's always about religion or is it just about connecting to source, connecting to family, pulling back and not being so involved in, in the rat race? Don, that is exactly the point. That's exactly the point of what I discovered about the Sabbath, which is, is that it is a re it is a really good idea uh, for people, for families, for communities to set aside a structured time in which to connect with each other. And that is at the heart what the Sabbath does. Hmm. Uh, you said, this is a quote from you, you said it's um, collect a collective time illness. What does that mean? Collective time sickness, actually. Um, I, I say we're, so we're sort of, um, we're driven by time yeah. uh, rather than driving it ourselves and it's making us sick. The idea of the Sabbath is not just that people, all people have the right not to work, which by the way was a radical and new idea when it was first conceived and written down in the Fourth Amendment. Not, it's not only that, it's that all people have the right to work, not to work, at the same time so that they can be together. And one of the things that's happening to us is that we're all, uh, we're, we're getting on these very different schedules and we're having a very hard time figuring out how to come together. And what the Sabbath does is it creates this situation in which there's just a structured period in which we can come together. So is this the first step? And maybe that is the answer to my next question. Is going to say, what's the first step if, he, if someone's watching and they say, you know what, I need to do that? Um, basically, the first step is to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you, you bring it into your life and try to get your family to do it with you. Uh, but one of the things I argue in the book is one of the ideas, the political ideas sort of embedded in the Sabbath is the idea that as a society we have the right to take control of our time and say maybe as a democratic society we want to decide to bring back some rules about what can and cannot be done one day a week. And we might want to start thinking about ways to encourage people not to work on that day. Okay, did you hear it? Religion aside, let's talk about the Sabbath. Well, you know, it was a radical new idea when it came into existence, as radical as Genesis chapter 2. But did you notice what she said at the end? That as a democratic society, speaking of United States of America, we should probably think about what one we should probably think about what we can or cannot do one day out of the week. She's talking about Sunday legislation and thinking of ideas as to how they could encourage people to rest on that day. Oh, brothers and sisters, they have plenty of ideas how they're going to encourage people to rest on one day. The Inquisition has a thousand and thousand upon thousand of ideas how to make you rest forever. Do you understand? Let's keep watching. You can't miss this. Can I, can I, uh... So Judith, you know, it's... Please don't laugh. So Judith...
Do you think, do you think that we should be Sabbathing again? Because we don't Sabbath much anymore. So, I think we Please should, but I don't think we have to do it in churches and synagogues, though I think if you want to do it in churches and synagogues, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But I think the Sabbath has all these lessons. The history of the Sabbath, which I, I tell some of in the book, uh, has all these lessons for us for teaching us how to organize our time so that it's possible for us to all get together at, a, at the same time and be together and form communities and civic associations and neighborhoods and all that stuff. So, but, what, but what does it mean? Like, if, if we all, Are we all going to make up our own minds about what the Sabbath means? Isn't the idea of the Sabbath and building this community is that there has to be a overarching idea of what the Sabbath is? Because if you Sabbath your Sabbath and I Sabbath my Sabbath, we're never going to co-Sabbath. Well, that. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen. But we can co-Sabbath at the same time. We can Sabbath at the same time. I say, make we it at the same know. time. You Sabbath on Saturday, and I Sabbath on Sunday. So and never the twain shall meet. So this is one of the weird things in the book. I am Jewish, but I, I, I say, I think we should probably go back to protecting Sunday. Did you hear that? She said, I am Jewish, but I think that we should go back to protecting Sunday. See, brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to share with you right now is right now there is a movement afoot for Sunday legislation to become a reality. And the minds of the people worldwide are being prepared for this day of rest. In many nations, it has already begun. But we are shown clearly in the Bible that the United States of America is literally the last hotbed of Bible prophecy. It is what the United States of America will do on this issue that will have an impact upon all the nations of our world. And right now, religious liberty is under fire in the United States of America. And God's people are getting ready to be brought to the forefront in a very serious way. Matter of fact, do you want to see how close we are to that? Actually. Really? Yeah. Welcome aboard. Turn your Bibles with me right now to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation the 13th chapter and we're going to begin at verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. Please, when you have it, say amen. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 11, And I saw another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a... The Bible says that John saw another beast because prior to seeing this beast he saw the beast of Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 coming up out of the sea and this beast that he saw was like unto a leopard it had feet of a bear it had a mouth of a lion it had seven heads ten horns and ten crowns upon those horns and the names of blasphemy on its forehead and that beast brothers and sisters was a symbol of the papacy but then he sees after that power received the deadly wound, which was in the year 1798, he saw another beast now come up into existence. And this beast had two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon. Now notice that I said earlier that the first beast was a symbol of the papacy. This is because in the Bible, a beast is symbolic of a kingdom. Let's prove that. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, and we're going to begin at verse 2. Daniel 7, and beginning at verse 2. Don't miss any of the information, though you may think you're familiar with these things, or though you may already be familiar with these things, because all of the information is invaluable. It will build a picture as we look at it this evening. In Daniel 7 and verse 2, the Bible says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by the night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Are you with me? Now look at verse 17, same chapter. It will define what these beasts are. It says here, Daniel 7 and 17. Are you there? Daniel 7 17. It says, These great beasts which are are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now go with me to verse 23. 
Bible tells us there, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy is symbolic of a kingdom. And we see these four great kingdoms coming up out of the sea. Do you remember what, is, what the sea or the waters are symbolic of in Bible prophecy? They're symbolic of nations, multitudes, peoples, and nations. Amen? Matter of fact, let's just read it. Let's make it clear. Revelation 17, 15. Revelation 17, 15. Repetition deepens impression. Revelation 17, 15. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. He said unto me, The woman which thou sawest, or rather, the, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sittest, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's right. So, the waters in the Bible are symbolic of peoples. Many people. Amen? So we see these four great kingdoms coming up in the midst of many people. They came into existence in a highly populated area. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 11, we see a beast not coming up out of the sea or the waters, but we see a beast coming up out of the earth, which is the direct opposite of the waters. Which means that this is a nation that rose into prominence in a sparsely populated place of the globe. Are you following? And when this nation comes up, it has two horns like a... The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of... which taketh away the sin of the... So the Lamb is the great symbol of Jesus Christ. This lets us know that when this nation would rise into prominence in a sparsely populated place on planet Earth, it would come up professing to be Christian in nature. It will profess to be a Christian nation. The Bible says that it would have two what? Horns like a lamb. Go with me to Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4. Are you tired yet? Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4. The Bible tells us in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4 what horns are symbolic of. Habakkuk. I know you haven't read that one recently. Chapter 3 and verse 4. Are you there? Look what the Bible says here. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hands. And therein was the hiding of his power. So horns in the Bible are symbolic of power. So those horns that are connected to that beast are symbolic of the power of that beast. But let me get a little bit more specific here. I want you to go home and study this for yourself. When you go into the Old Testament and you look at the Old Testament sanctuary system, have you ever heard of the sanctuary before? In the sanctuary, there were some pieces of furniture. In the outer court, you had the altar of burnt sacrifice. It had four corners and there were four horns at the corners of that altar. When the priest would take the blood from the sacrifice that was presented by the sinner that was confessing his sins, that blood would be taken and placed on each one of those horns on the four horns of that altar. Symbolic of the fact that there is power in the blood to cleanse us from all of our sin. Because the number four is a complete number. The power in the blood can completely cleanse us from all of our sin. If you go into the most holy place, which was the first department of the sanctuary. I said the most holy place, didn't I? The holy place, which is the first department of the sanctuary. We had three pieces of furniture in there. On the, um, on the south side, you had the candlesticks. On the north side, you had the table of showbread. And pressing hard against the veil that separated the holy from the most holy, you had the altar of burnt incense. And that altar also had four horns on it. The priest would also take blood and place them on those horns. By the way, that altar of incense was symbolic of the prayers of the saints ascending to God mingled with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the blood going on those horns was symbolic that there's power in prayer. Are you getting it? See, if you paid attention to what I'm sharing with you, you'll notice something. Horns in the Bible are symbolic of power of whatever they're connected to. Did you get it? 
in Revelation 13 and verse 11, those horns are not connected to altars. They're connected to a beast. But the beast is the symbol of a, a kingdom. So those horns are symbolic of governmental powers. Make sense? And whatever those governmental powers are, they promote the principles of the Lamb. Come on, follow me! Because those two horns are like a... What are some principles? I want you to follow this now. What are some principles that are connected to Jesus Christ in the Bible, that Jesus Christ brings into our life? Because if we can find out what those principles are, then we can find out what those powers are connected to that beast. Are you following me? Okay, if you're following me. Go with me. Let's start here. Go with me to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, beginning at verse 6. Here's another scripture I know most of you know. Isaiah 9, beginning at verse 6. When you have it, say amen. I'm going to start quoting it because I know you already know it. Un For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase and the what? Come on now. I'm going to read it. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with what? With judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So notice that Christ's government will be established forever because he will promote the principles of a judgment system that promotes justice. Did you hear that? He sets in place a judgment system that doesn't just judge, but it promotes justice. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 now. What are some other principles associated with the Lamb who is Jesus Christ? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. See, I give you so many scriptures so that when you go home, you can't say you didn't get the Bible. You can't say, I didn't like what the brother said. No, you didn't like what the Bible said. Because I'm giving you scripture. Amen? Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Are you there? Speaking of the Lamb, Jesus Christ... Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. What were two principles you saw associated with Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb, in Galatians 5 and verse 1? Liberty and freedom. Okay. And in Galatians, and rather in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7, he would establish judgment that would promote justice. All of these connected to the Lamb. Okay, so let's break it down now. In Revelation 13 and verse 11, I saw another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, or rather this. There was a nation that rose up in a sparsely populated place on planet earth, when it came into existence, it professed to be a Christian nation. And it established a system of government with a judicial system that would promote liberty and freedom and justice for all. What nation do you know of that does all these things? There's only one nation, brothers and sisters. That's the United States of America. You don't need a history book, you need the Bible. It's the United States of America that's being spoken of right here in Revelation 13 and verse 11. And we're told that this professed Christian nation that promotes liberty and freedom and justice for all, primarily through these two great principles that they have at the foundation of their government, which is republicanism. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And Protestantism, which is religious liberty, freedom of conscience. You can worship what you want to worship, when you want to worship, how you want to worship. We're told that this nation will one day speak like a dragon. 
The dragon, brothers and sisters, according to Revelations 12 and 9, is the symbol of the devil himself. That means that that nation, my country, will move away from its Christian roots and begin to carry out the agenda of the devil. The only way that a nation can speak is through its legislation and through its judicial bodies. That means in the near future, or maybe even now, the United States of America will or is even now setting in place legislation that will promote the designs of the devil. And the devil only has one agenda. And it's found within Revelation 12 and verse 17. Revelation 12 and 17. Revelation 12 and 17. I'm coming to an end now. But I'm gonna, I got a couple more things I want to show you if you want to see them. Revelation 12 and 17. The Bible says the agenda, the agenda of the dragon is, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil's agenda, the dragon's agenda, is to persecute, destroy, and annihilate God's commandment-keeping people. Which means the United States of America will or is already beginning to set in place legislation that is designed for the purpose of dealing with God's people. The speech of the dragon. And you know what kills me? People think that when the dragon speaks, like it's going to be like, ah, you know, like it's going to be something that you're just going to be able to pick out the hat. It's just going to be blatant. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, you know the dragon has another title in the Bible. You know that, right? It's in Revelations 12 and 9. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. I'll just leave it right there. Notice the dragon was called that old serpent. Remember what the Bible says about that serpent in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So when the United States of America begins to set in place legislation that is for the purpose of dealing with God's people, that legislation will go forth very subtly as to not alert the fears of God's people. Oh, I didn't see it on CNN. Of course you didn't see it on CNN, brother. It's going subtly. Or you may have seen it on CNN and didn't even know that it was for you. By the way, let's just go one more step further with this. The dragon primarily is a symbol of the devil in the Bible. Am I right or wrong here? That's true. Revelation 12 and 9 proves that. That means anything the Bible says in reference to the character of the devil is also in reference to the character of the dragon. Am I right or wrong? Because the dragon and the devil are one and the same. So let's look what the Bible has to say about the devil. Go with me to John chapter 8 and verse 44. I'm giving you this scripture so that you can see how the dragon speaks. John chapter 8 and verse 44. John 8 and verse 44. When you have it, say amen. The Bible tells us here, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. Why? For there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie... He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Two principles associated with the devil, whom is the dragon, is that he's a murderer and a liar. So, when the United States of America speaks like a dragon, it will set in place legislation that has murderous designs for God's people, but that legislation will go forth subtly and it will be concealed within a lie. Did you catch that? Now, what is the lie that will conceal 
the murderous designs that will be contained within the legislation? What will be the lie? Well, before we go any further, because you're saying Sunday law, before we go any further, let's just prove it from the Bible. Before we go any further, who's the father of lies? You just read it from your Bible. So anytime someone speaks, they're speaking under the, a lie. They're speaking under the influence of the? Or they're speaking like a dragon. You got the point? Go with me now to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 3. Jeremiah 7 and verse 3. What is the lie that will conceal the murderous designs for God's people? Jeremiah 7 and 3. Are you there with me? The Bible tells us here in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 3. There's, are, you, are you there? Okay, the Bible says, They bend their tongues like their bows for... Am I saying the wrong thing? Am I saying the wrong thing? There's no 7-3? I'm giving you the wrong chapter. Jeremiah 9, 3. That's all right. You got to put me to the law and to the testimony too. I did it to you. It's okay. Amen. Why are we there now? Bible tells us Jeremiah 9, 3. Jeremiah 9, 3. This is correct. It says, they bend their tongues like their what? Bows for lies. Yet they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil and they know not me, saith the Lord. Pay close attention. When they're getting ready to speak a lie, they bend their tongues like a... They're talking about a bow and arrow here. Now question, do you use a bow and arrow for hand-to-hand -hand combat? You use a bow and arrow for long-distance hunting, don't you? So in other words, that lie has far-reaching implications. Did you get the point? In other words, it's shot back here. You may not know what's getting ready to happen, but shortly, it's going to hit its target. It has far-reaching applications. You get the point. So in other words, the lie might be spoken now. You might not know the effects of the lie now, but you will feel it in the future. Go with me now to verse 8, same chapter. Look at what the lie is now. Here's our answer. The Bible tells us here, their tongue is like an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. Did you get it? What's the lie, brothers and sisters? The lie is peace. You didn't get it. Have mercy. He speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he layeth his weight. The lie is peace. The legislation that will contain the murderous designs for God's people that will have far-reaching implications. When the legislation is set in place, it will be set in place, and the purpose they will say that it is set in place for is for peace. Okay, let me break it down further for you. Citizens of the United States of America, after 9-11, the borders of the United States of America have never been the same. And now once again, after the bombings in Boston, we see that terrorism is on the rise in our country. And because we want to ensure that our children and our grandchildren will be able to continue it to enjoy the wonderful privileges that we have enjoyed for, for, for generations in our nation. We need to set in place this legislation. Yes, it will strip you of some of your freedoms, but it's to ensure, it's, it's, it's to ensure your peace and safety. That's what they said to us right after 9-11, and they put in the Patriot Act. It worked then. <laughs> it worked then. It's going to work again. Let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. You think they're not setting up for you? They might not even know that they're setting up for you, but the devil is using them to set it up for you. Let me show you something here. 
Let me show you something. Look at this. At the end of 20, 2011, actually, beginning 2012, President Obama set in place a piece of legislation. Oh, it's the end of 2012, actually. He set in place a piece of legislation that single-handedly destroyed our Bill of Rights. That might, mean, that might not mean anything to you right now, but remember... When it goes down in America, it's going down everywhere. And the destruction of the Bill of Rights, brothers and sisters, is tearing down those lamb-like horns. That means the speech of the dragon is going down now. This piece of legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act, has now empowered the U.S. government to lock up U.S. citizens in military detention facilities for an indefinite period of time. That means they can see me on the street, throw me in the back of a black van, take me to a military detention facility. I don't have to have a court hearing, no trial, no evidence presented in the court. They can leave me in that prison, rot and die. Nobody in my family has to know where I'm at. They can torture me, end of story. This is what President Obama, he attached this signing statement to this piece of legislation. I want you to hear what he said. Moreover, I want to clarify that my administration will not authorize the indefinite military detention without trial of American citizens. Indeed, I believe that doing so would break with our most important traditions and values as a nation. Okay, I have two questions I want to ask you. Question number one, how many of you here believe a politician's promise? Okay, question number two, he promises that they won't do it under his administration. But what about the next administration? And then forget about the questions, let me give you the facts. The fact of the matter is this. A senator by the name of senator, senator Levine, during one of the Senate sessions, he said directly on the floor, on video, that Obama and his administration required that the indefinite detention of American citizens be introduced into this piece of legislation if they wanted him to sign it into law. You didn't get my point. In other words, what he's saying he wouldn't do, he's saying he actually asked for it. So the brother lied off the top, unfortunately. But maybe he'll be honest and won't lock up a U.S. citizen because you know they have legislation to get around that as well. Because shortly after passing this piece of legislation, they passed this piece of legislation that I'm getting ready to show you right now which is called the Enemy Expatriation Act. Simply means that the United States government can strip U.S. citizens of their citizenship. Which means that you're no longer a U.S. citizen. So if you're no longer a U.S. citizen, then they can just throw you into the facility and Obama can keep his promise. Because you're not a citizen anymore. But don't worry! It's only for people that are violent extremists, enemy combatants, or terrorists. Did I tell you earlier that people that teach end time prophecies are almost... Okay, yeah. You get the point? Brothers and sisters, it's already being prepared. Okay, let's close with this one. These are some of the executive orders. Does any, has anybody here ever heard of an executive order? Executive orders are orders that the president can declare without any, you know, not, he can just put it in, put it in place and Congress has no say-so, okay? 
It comes from the top down. That's it. Executive order. These are some orders that Obama has put in place since he's been president. Executive order 10990 allows the government to take over all modes of transportation and control of highways and seaports. Executive order 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. Executive order 10997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. Executive order 10998 allows the government to take over all food resources and and farms that you will neither buy nor sell. Revelation 13. Oh yes, it's all on the books. The devil is ready to deal with those who won't bow the knee to the mark of the beast. Jesus living at this point, brother. I'm going to tell you this right now. We need to get out into the country. What the brother said is a fact. But when you go, you better take Jesus with you. Because there ain't no place to run, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you that right now. If you didn't see what I showed you earlier, there is no place to run. Country living ain't for running. It's for preparation. Remember, John the Baptist went out into the wilderness. Why? He wasn't running. Brother was getting prepared for war. Executive Order 11000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. What does that mean? Brother, that's talking about government supervised slavery. Oh, did the Bible speak of that? The Bible says... And causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that they might buy, that they might not buy nor sell. Come on now. Executive Order 11001 allows the government to take over all health education, health education and welfare functions. You better learn medical missionary work. telling you natural remedies is a beautiful thing and stop depending on those pills take two call them in the morning take two call them in the morning take two you ain't gonna see them the next morning Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. <laughs> Executive Order 11003 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft, including commercial aircraft. Okay, let's get to my favorites. Executive Order 11004 allows the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, building new housing, with public funds, designate areas to be abandoned and establish new locations for populations. It sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like it's like government funding, funded housing. Brothers and sisters, it's government funded housing, but it ain't the type of housing that you want to be in. Yeah, ask FEMA. That's right. Because the housing is, is all furnished with barbed wire fences and security cameras just for you. Executive Order 11005 allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public store. Listen, brother, let me tell you something. The stuff I'm talking about right here, okay, you may not know. These things are in existence. I'm not talking about stuff. I'm not, flying, I'm not just flying off the top. You know, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not just saying stuff to you right now. I'm telling you validated facts. Allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11049 assigns emergency preparedness function to federal departments and agencies consolidating 21 operated, operative executive orders issued after a 15-year period. And now to the final ones. Let's go. Executive Order 11051 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect. How many of them? 
all into effect in times of increased international tensions and economic or financial crisis. If there's a financial crisis, all of them can go into effect immediately. But our finances are looking good worldwide right now. I'm being sarcastic. Executive Order 11310 grants authority to Department of Justice to enforce the plan set out in executive orders to institute industrial support to establish judicial and legislative liaisons. Here's the part some of you guys like. To control all aliens. You're visiting the U.S. anytime soon. To control all aliens to operate penal correctional institutions, and to advise, advise, and assist the president. And last but certainly not least, Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over the mechanisms of production and distribution of energy sources, wages, salaries, Credit and the flow of money in the U.S. financial institution, all monies, in any undefined national emergency. There's a national emergency. We need to take over the monetary system. What's the national emergency? We can't tell you. It's undefined. Why? It's a security risk for us to tell you. But that's not the worst part. It also provides that when a state of emergency is declared by the president, Congress cannot review the action for six months. That means for six months, we have an uncontrolled dictator. Brothers and sisters, it's coming. I want you to know, when the United States of America sneezes on this issue, the whole world is going to catch the cold. A national Sunday law is on the horizon. Church and state is on the horizon. And we as God's people must find ourselves rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ now like never before. I have a short testimony I'd like to share with you, and then I'm going to close on this. A few years ago, as I was doing the call porter work, I had started um, going to churches, bringing the health message. And I remembered as I was, as I was out one day, I, I came to this series of quite large white buildings, and I went inside, because one of them looked to me to be a, a church, and I went inside and I didn't see anybody and I looked around for a while and I got, I found myself into this, I found myself in an office and there was a secretary behind the desk and I talked with her for a moment and at that point I was made uh, aware of the fact that I was currently inside of the headquarters of the ecumenical movement there in the New York. Now if you don't know what the ecumenical movement is, the ecumenical movement was something that was started by the Roman Catholic Church. And the purpose of the ecumenical movement is to bring all churches back under the umbrella of Mother Rome. Whatever denomination you are, Jewish and Islam included. And, of course, my eyebrow raised. She got on the phone and she made a phone call. Shortly thereafter, a gentleman came out. It was one of the directors of the ecumenical movement. And he came out and I extended my hand to shake his hand and he didn't shake my hand. I found that to be very interesting. Um, undaunted, I just continued to share with him my purpose for being there. And by some means, I don't even remember how, we, we got into this conversation with one another and we began to discuss different issues. And as we were discussing some different things, he began to kind of squint his eyes as he looked at me. And he said, what school did you go to? And I told him the school that I went to. And he said, I knew there was something different about you. You're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? I'm just telling what the brother said to me. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, he stepped back and he said, well, you know, the best preacher I ever heard was a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, that preacher sure did know his Bible. 
And for a couple of minutes, he began to talk about this Seventh-day Adventist minister that he said sure knew his Bible. And then after he finished doing that, he looked at me once again and he said, so you know what we're doing here then? He says, you know all about the Council of Nice. You know what Constantine the Great did in 321 AD? You know about the Council of Laodice? This man began to ravel off all of the history that I would use in a Daniel Revelation seminar so that one could clearly see that the papacy is the antichrist power that is spoken of in Bible prophecy. My mouth was so open I could have caught every fly that was in the room. I was shocked. And then I... And then I got over the shock real quick and I got real militant. I said, so you know that I know what you know. And then he just hung his head and shook his head. This conversation between me and this gentleman took place a day after I was having a conversation with my late father. And the conversation I had with my father was, we were saying, I wonder if these people that are behind pushing Sunday for a day of rest know what they're really doing. Brothers and sisters, there are some people, it's, made, it's not all, it's not all. Many are moving in absolute ignorance. Many are moving thinking that they're performing the will of God. Many are moving in this direction thinking that they're being faithful to Christ, desiring to be faithful to Christ. They're deceived. But there are others that know what they're doing as well. And brothers and sisters, as plans are being laid, what are we doing? What type of preparations are you making? What are you doing in your daily life? What are you doing in your home? What are you doing with your children to prepare them to stand in this crisis hour? Can your child stand without you there with him or, him or her? Or will your child be willing to give up everything called Jesus? What is the example that you're leading in your home before your children? What is the example that you're leading in your workplaces before your co-workers or your classmates? What are you doing to prepare for this crisis? Brother, I'll tell, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what we need to be doing. We need to do what John said in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The only way we can stand in this hour is if we allow Jesus Christ to give us the victory over the sins that we are struggling with in our hearts. I don't care what you are struggling with. There is power in Christ to gain the victory. And more than ever now, we need to tap into that power because the hour is at hand. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I have two appeals I'm going to make this evening and then I'm going to close in prayer. My first appeal is to my brothers and sisters that have already accepted the faith of Jesus Christ. But as we consider these things this evening, clearly from the Word of God, you have seen from the Word of God and then the current events that we are right now on the edge of the end of all things. And you realize you need to stop professing to be a Christian and start being a servant of the Most High God. It's time to stop with the compromise. It's time to set aside that time for morning and evening worship. Not just for yourself, but with your children, with your spouses. You know it's time to be ready and stay ready. If this evening you want to recommit your heart to that work of being ready in Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand with me. I'm taking my stand as well. I want to be ready. As you continue to bow your heads and close your eyes, I make my final appeal and then we're going to pray. My final appeal is to you that it, you, my friend, that has come here this night may have been invited by someone, but it was really the Spirit of God that brought you here. God wanted you to know what's going on in the world because He wants you to be wise so that you can make a wise decision. He wants you to have information so that you can use it for the betterment of yourself 
and those whom you know stand in need of this same knowledge as well. But before you can do anything with this knowledge, you need Jesus in your life. Because the power comes from being connected with Jesus. All the knowledge in the world can't save us. And tonight, as the Spirit of God has revealed to you what's going on in the world, as the Spirit of God has revealed to you that the Word of God is true, that all that the Bible says is true, and you are realizing that that means as well that it's true, that you need to have a Savior. If it is your desire this evening to say, Lord, I don't know what it really means to be a Christian, but I know I want to be a Christian. I know I'm not prepared, but I want to be prepared. I know I need help. And I'm looking to you for help. If tonight you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior for the very first time, the very first time, I invite you to raise your hand wherever you're at. Is there anyone here like that this evening that would like to accept Jesus into their hearts? That would like to be prepared in this crisis hour? God bless. Praise God. Praise God. Don't, let, don't be scared because people are here. Brothers and sisters, some people here won't even pay your cell phone bill for you. You're worried about your soul salvation? You can't worry about people. I tell you right now, people will run and leave you. They'll laugh at you, and when you need them, they're not going to be there for you, but Jesus will never leave you. Jesus is willing to take his stand for you. Are you willing to stand for him? Is there anyone else here tonight that would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior for the very first time? This is going to be my last appeal. And then I'm going to close. Don't turn up your opportunity. It may be your last. And then with no further ado, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit being here with us this evening. And I thank you for the things that you've revealed to us in your word. And I know that your spirit has been working on many hearts tonight. Now, Father, as, you, as your son himself said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Many of us here have been in the truth, but we know that we have not been abiding in the truth. And as we realize that now is the time to make our calling and election sure, we pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you would strengthen us to be faithful to you, faithful in our homes, faithful to our wives, our husbands, our children, our parents, that we will seek by faith daily to live in Christ Jesus. And I pray for those this evening that raised their hands to say that they would want to accept you into their hearts as their Lord and Savior for the very first time. We thank you for them as well. And I pray for them, Lord, that you would keep them from falling and that you would not allow the enemy to turn them from their decisions. And Father, I pray specially as well for those tonight whom I know your Spirit has spoken to and told them that they need to accept you into their hearts. But because of embarrassment, they did not raise their hands. I ask, Father, that you would give them no peace, that you would grant them no success in this life, that they might be able to enjoy the eternal bliss and the treasures numberless that, tr that, that heaven has to offer them. Father, thank you for being so merciful and loving towards us. And as we leave this place, grant us traveling mercies. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for thy name's sake. Amen. God bless you.